Hello again, Saints. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to another Thursday night Bible study and watching another Romans chapter 16 survey. And we're continuing on in our Romans chapter 16 survey. We are looking at a very vital and important part of our edifying, our establishment, our um, being who call God has called us to be in Christ, and that is to be perfect. That is to be to be strong in the faith. That is to be approved. That is to be, as we're going to see, blameless in the doctrine. The bond of perfectness, putting on the a, a charity, the selfless love of God. And we're going to see all that. But let's take a look at Romans chapter 16. We're going to be looking at Romans 16, verse 31. Lesson 31, I'm sorry. Lesson 31. Okay, let's get it together. <laughs> Lesson 31, we're, going to be, we're looking at uh, him that is of power, establishing the perfect and the perfect in the power, the perfect in the power of God. And, and when we see what's being spelled out there in Romans 16, and we're going to see that, um, it, it's all going to come together. And you're going to see what Paul is doing here. And when we get to, when we're in Romans uh, 16, and most oftentimes when we look at Romans 16, we get to verse 25. All we see there is, now to him that is the power to establish you. And Paul says, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. Now I said last time that we were going to look at the three according. And uh, we're not going to get a chance to look at that this time. We'll look at it the next time. Because I wanted to um, hone in and make sure you all fully understand the power issue there because we, we we graze right past that now to him that is of power to establish you we, we just graze right past that and all we see is oh my gospel we're to be established by by the Paul says my gospel and then we argue is this my gospel talking about justification unto eternal life or is this talking about sanctification the mystery but there's way more way more to the verse than than only just that folks it this is this is as i said vital it's essential in being who god has called us to be as son mature sons and daughters in christ ones that are strong in the faith and we're you're going to see let me just give you a little example here when it says romans in romans 16 25 now to him that is of power to establish you if you take, just say, the, the person that owns Apple or Facebook or YouTube, it could be the same person, I don't know. But you take, you go to work for a company, and they tell you that the CEO of Google, just say, or Amazon, he himself, the actual owner, the actual CEO, wants to establish you. And this is not the uh, direct, this is not the department head in receiving. This is not the person that's in charge of hiring in your city. This is not even just the director of hiring. This is the CEO himself wants to establish you. Now, you know yourself that if the owner themselves, the person with the power is going to establish you. He's going to be giving you a great task. He's going to be giving you something essential, something vital, something very, very, um, something you can't afford not to have. That's what we're being given here. When it says, now to him that is of power to establish you. And you can't allow, you can't just let that fly past you, folks, because it's here for a reason. The same reason why when you get down to um, verse 27, when it says, to God only wise, be glory through Jesus Christ. In comparison to who or to, to what? Why would Paul have to say to God only wise? Because God's wisdom is put on display. And it's put on display in the next, the next epistle, 1 <laughs> Corinthians. Why do you think Paul goes over the wisdom of God, the wisdom of men, 
the wisdom of God and the mystery, the wisdom of men. Men can't handle the, the, the word of God or the spirit of God. He can't discern it. Neither is he able to know it. And then it says, but well, we have the mind of Christ. Folks, this, may, this makes perfect sense. If we're operating upon a spiritual mind and, and, we're, and we're allowing ourselves to be strong in the doctrine. And the other thing, we're going to look at this as well. When you look here, when, when, when verse 20, Romans 16, verse 20, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. We just skim right over that. But if you think about this, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet. Again, another vital doctrine that you have to get. Because if you think about this, just say you get hired into another company. Just say Pepsi, just say Pepsi hires you. And the adversary of Pepsi would be just say Coke, Coca-Cola. But they tell you when they hire you that Coca-Cola is going to be defeated by you. You're going to, you're going to be you're going to be instrumental to the downfall of Coca-Cola. Now, wouldn't you think that's great authority or great great benefit there? You're being given you're being you're entrusted with 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 something of of power? I would hope you would. But that's what we're being, we're being told, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under our feet. We're going to be using the God of peace. We're going to be knowing him as the God of peace because we're going to need him as the God of peace. When we are wise unto that which is good and simple concerning eat the evil of this world. And we're not going to be as the simple as in verse 17, verse 18, uh, tossed to and fro and all, and, 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 and good words and fair speeches when you can expose this world. And we saw the verses there. The Lord said himself, when he told the apostles, he said in John, John chapter 7, verse 6, he, he told them, he said, the world cannot, cannot hate you. The world didn't hate him yet because they didn't testify of the world yet. The Lord testified of the world that it was evil. And he wanted, he wanted, he was wise into that which is good. And he knew the evil. He exposed it. He testified of it. Folks, this is all going to make, hopefully, quite a bit of sense. And, you know, and I can tell when I, when I talk with people about this, and some people, when I talk to them about this, and they just stand there and look at me, I already know it's not even taking, taking any, any rain with them. But there are a few that I've talked with about this, and they said, whoa, because it ought to be a, a whoa moment, because this is the end all game that you're going to see. You're going to see verses where Paul says that, that uh, to the end that you may be blameless. Remember when Paul started off uh, the book of Romans? He started off the book of Romans told them about a gift that he desired that they have. And then he says here in verse, um, in, uh, I could go the whole, you know what? I'll just go to the cut at the verse itself. Verse 11, I long to see you that I might impart unto you some spiritual gift to the, what? End that ye, ye may be established. Then you get over here. And he talks about that it's to establish you. Now, what is that gift? We're going to see it's the power. It's the power. You're going to see all those verses that, that, that Paul talks about. Be, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And um, when, he was, when he was besought the Lord three times that, the, that this thing might leave from him, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And, and, and about the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, when I'm weak, then I am strong. It's our inner man. Let, let's just get to the verses, folks. Let uh, Come to Romans 16, verse 25. 
Romans 16, verse 25. And for those that have been following along, this should take effect. But for those that are just tuning in and, you know, haven't been, haven't uh, gotten prior doctrine, it, it might not take take effect. It It's hardly the case that it would. But look at Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which is kept secret since the world began but is now made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known unto all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Now, Again, when I said when, next time we're going to look at the accordings, there's three according to uh, mentioned there, and there's reasons why that that's the case, and and we'll probably finish up, end up the um, the uh, survey with that, but we're going to do a review as well. But I mean, we're going to go through that and look at the accordings, and then look at to God only wise. I, you know what? I might spend another study. Just looking at to God only wise, because it's vital to understand that going into First Corinthians. Because if God's only wise, he desires sons and daughters to be wise as well. It, you're, so, you're to think like he does. It, you ought to in this world, in this life, it, as being sons and daughters. That's to him that is of power to establish you. Now come over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And remember I said that this is going to be the, this is the end all. This is what, what God desires. That power be given to ones that are strong. Ones that are perfect. Ones that are blameless. Ones that are approved. And, and we're going to see all the verses. And, but and you know yourself, God would desire that a, that a one that's strong in the faith, that not only he just be strong in the faith, but he be a Bible teacher as well, and that he teach others to be strong in the faith. You know the verses, Romans fifteen. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Now, now look at verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires the good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Now, notice all these things. A bishop must be, but the first things first, he must be blameless. And that blameless there being mentioned is, is, is perfectness. That without blame, that and without blame is not to say the man won't sin, but what it's, what it's saying is the man is walking in, he's walking with the new man. He's put on the doctrine. He is being one that is operating upon the power. He's operating upon that power. He, he is able to also, Satan is able to be bruised under his feet. You don't think so? Look at look at the look at uh, verse three. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now wait a minute. If he's lifted up with pride, well, sure he'll fall into the condemnation of the devil because that's what the devil operates upon: pride, wisdom, beauty. Those are the three things he operates upon: the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That's what he operates upon. So again, if a man of God is operating upon pride, he's operating with Satan because the complete opposite of pride is what God wants us to be. He wants us to be selfless and sober. Look, look at verse 7. Moreover, he must have a good report of them that are without. Notice the selflessness right there. Lest he fall into reproach and into and the snare of the devil. 
Why would he fall into the snare of the devil and reproach? Well, because if you have good report of them or, that are without, you're going to follow what God says. You're going to be give. You're going to give up of yourself because they don't have. They're without. You're going to make sure that they have. That's how God. That's how godliness is. But do you know 99.9% .9 of preachers today, unsaved and saved, are, are, do not have good report to them that are without. Matter of fact, they are always the ones that have, and, and most of their congregation are without. But the preacher has more than they have. And that they have fallen into reproach and the snare of the devil. Look at uh, look at chapter 3. Uh, and verse 10. And let these also first be proved. Let them use the office of a deacon. Let them that use the office of a deacon be found blameless. Now, remember I used the word I said not just uh, blameless and perfect, but also approved. And that's approved according to the word of God, according to the faith, according to sound doctrine. But notice it says the bishops also must be found. They're, yeah, they're found by the preacher, by, by, the, by the bishop. He finds that these people are blameless in the sight of God, according to the doctrine. Mature, strong in the faith. Look at, uh, look, look at Titus. Look at what Paul says to Titus about this. And you're going to see it's the same thing. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy looser. Now, every single thing there. Is not it is complete opposite to what today's preacher does. Being blameless, they, what they think blameless is, well, nobody found them cheating on their wife, nobody found them with a drink in their hand, nobody found them listening to any any rap music, uh, nobody heard them cussing before. That's it. If they do those four to five different things, no drugs either. Of course, let's throw that in there. If none of those things, they feel that that's it. But also, it says as a steward of God, not self-willed because self-willed is selfish. Evidently, the opposite, in which is godliness, is selfless. Not soon angry, not given a wide, no striker. Notice filthy lucre. That's because that's what the heart of man wants. Everything you see that, that's made mention there is what the heart of the man, the old man, want, desires to go after. But what you're seeing here, you're seeing that, as I said before, and I say the end game, because it that is, I'll, you know what, let's just use the word the end, or the, and I'm saying that to, you know, I'm, I'm trying to Pick my words um, carefully here because a lot of times people will assume I'm saying something else. Like, I'm, like I'm talking about the the rapture, like the rapture is here now or it's coming today, which we ought to act like it is. Our salvation is nearer than we believed. Now was the perfect, the, the accepted time, and all these things. But I'm saying that um, in Paul, when Paul said that to the end that ye may be established, or when, we're going to look at the verses in a second. Uh, confirm you to the end, and um, and uh, you may be found blameless, and all those words being used. I'm going to just use that word. We'll just say the end, or maybe well, the end result is that we be strong in the faith, that we be perfect or perfect in doctrine, in knowledge, and again. I, you know, I hate to even keep, you know, going back to those that mention about our adoption as sons, and they'll say things like, oh, you say that it has to be a growth process, and you, again, folks, 
You don't have to. You can just only just be justified unto eternal life if that's what you desire to do. But for those that desire to be strong in the faith and not be the ones as the weak, the ones that desire to be strong in the faith and complete, stand perfect and complete in him, we, we ought to grow. Romans chapter 16, it's the capstone of it. It's the climactic doctrine given to, to cap off a foundation of doctrine. And that's why Paul is, he brings it, he sums it up. He's talking to perfect saints. Salute this person, greet that person, salute that person. And he's talking about all these people that labored with him. He makes mention in Romans 16, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks. And he talks about others. These are also like-minded Strong in the faith, saints. And then Paul even tells them some things to beware of and, and mark them and, 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 and about the God of peace shall bruise Satan under their feet shortly. He's not going to bruise. He, the God of peace cannot bruise Satan under Joel Osteen's feet. Because Joel Osteen is on standing on the back of Satan. So, again... We might think that, um, you know, we could be quick. Some will say, well, who are you to judge? Well, I'm told. He that is spiritual judgeth all things. And I have enough discernment to be able to know that Joel Osteen uh, doesn't know, doesn't know the, the God of peace. He doesn't know the God of hope. He doesn't know the God of comfort. He gives a false hope. A false comfort, a false love, a false peace. And again, let's let's just move on and get into the doctrine here. First Corinthians chapter one, look at verse uh, seven. So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice he wants to give him a gift. Who shall shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that gift he's talking about is not the gift of tongues and everything else, spiritual gifts, but that is the spiritual gift of knowledge. That is wisdom. And if you don't think it is, look at the verse, the verse right before it. Actually, the verse, verse 5 that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming. And I should have included that, but I just gave it to you there. <laughs> but again, that's it. The gift is knowledge that's being spoken of. You putting your nose in the book and that you operating upon the power Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 here. But I, what I was after there in verse 8 was that ye, verse 8 again, who shall also confirm you unto the end? Notice, confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. If someone confirms you unto the end, if you think about that, just say you go somewhere and you stand at a hotel and you want to make sure that they got your reservations and you're just getting in town and someone tells you, hey, we have you confirmed unto the end. You could feel a sense of comfort in that, knowing that they didn't give your room away, that they do have you have your confirmation uh, and all these things. And you are. They do have your it, it, unto the end. They have you, whether it's. You know, I don't have to get into every, uh, everything else with that, but confirming you unto the end, that is, notice who's going to do it. And it says that ye may be blameless. And that blameless again, folks, is that being perfect, being, being strong in the faith, being as we're seeing here, uh, the ones that are 
mature in doctrine, sons, blameless sons. Look at it, it you're going to see that. Look at Ephesians 1, verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him, in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame. Notice, without blame before him in love. And you know, another thing I want to bring out too. What you're going to be seeing here, and I want you to you know, pay attention to this here as well. You're going to be seen before the world. Before the, It's going to say before the world. And when we looked at uh, Romans 16, it talks about which was kept secret since the world began. A a and before the world. And all these things, you're going to see it over and over again because it was God's design before the world began that we be strong in the faith. That we be perfect. Well, if you don't think that's the case, what do you think God's intent was for Adam to be? Perfect. After him, in his image, after his likeness. That's what God desires that we be. And that's why you see Paul saying over and over, he's going to mention the day of Christ. He's going to mention in that day or the, uh, uh, the end. Because that's God's desire that we would be that way. And that he desires that, that, that when it's all said and done or the end, that we be perfect, blameless, approved. Look at um, verse 5. Having predestinated unto us the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. You notice how... He's talking about, uh, in that day, the adoption of children. It's not the adoption of sons. It's the adoption of children. That's going to be out there in that day that he's going to be speaking about in Ephesians chapter 1. Now look over at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 13. <clears throat> For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do you know if somebody tells you they're gonna they want you to do something of just say the good pleasure of the just say the the state or or let's just say the the city and just say you get a speeding ticket and they, and and they tell you well you know the one way you can you can get this off your record or if or if you do our good pleasure which is some people will say well community service or whatever the issue is but that's the good the good his good pleasure that that's well pleasing unto the father and you don't think it's the father we know it's god but in the father's sight as a father with sons and daughters that we be good sons do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. But notice that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God. There's that perfectness, folks. That's the sons operating upon that power. The ones that are established in the power. And ones that are established in the power because they're wise into that which is good and simple concerning evil. When things come up in our life, as I said before, when things come up in your life and you see something, uh, your, your enemy does something to you. And instead of you persecuting because he persecuted you, you bless. Because if you pers he persecutes you, you get upset. And he's a persecutor. Now when you persecute him, you are the persecutor. You're walking you put on his identity. But the power is you walk in the ident identity of God, regardless what this world throws at you. That's where the power is. Walking in his word, regardless what the world throws at you. That, notice what it says in verse 15, that he may be blameless and harmless. Because before that, it was without murmurings or disputings. Because murmuring, murmurings and disputings would be what you would do because you're putting on the identity of this world. You're murmuring and disputing because someone else murmured and disputed against you 
or did something to offend you and you murmured or disputed. So, this is telling you, do all things, all things. And that's that will be to his good pleasure. That's his will. And that's you being blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst, even though you're in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, you're supposed to shine as lights in the world. Just like Melchizedek, in, in the midst of a perverse and crooked nation. But come over to uh, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. That right there is what we're taught to do. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. And when you're proving all things, you're taking God's word and you're using, it's as if God's word is a magnifying glass. And when you look at something in this world, you hold God's word up there and you look right through that. And you should be able to identify what God's word says by uh, whatever you're proving it with. It could be whatever in the world that comes up. And then you'll say, now, how did they respond to that? How did the apostles respond? How did the Lord respond? How did the apostle Paul that I'm told to follow respond? Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good in the sight of God. Abstrain from all appearance of evil. Wait a minute. Appearance? You mean to tell me you're going to be able to see it? You're going to be able to know that it's evil now? Of course. See, this, this is mature doctrine, folks. This is not telling you don't go in the way of evil, but this is telling you to abstain from all appearance of evil. Because at this point, these Thessalonians knew what was evil, and they knew what evil looked like. That's the point. When you know what evil looks like, you'll say, yeah, that's not right. Let me abstain from that. But some people don't, don't understand it. You got people that have been rightly dividing the word of truth for 40 years and do not know what the evil is. They, they look right past the evil. They think these days that we have are, are, are holy. It, uh, it, but that's evil. That's the evil of this world. Man himself created those days and told you what day to love. He told you what day to hold to, uh, to esteem one day above another. That's what man told you to do. And look at verse uh, look at verse 23 here. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. Why do you think it says, and the very God of peace? And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. You notice here, the God of peace is doing something again. Remember in chapter 16 of Romans, the God of peace is going to bruise Satan under our feet. Well, the God of, it's the word of the God of peace. We are looking at God's word, and we need to operate upon his peace. As the Lord said, the peace I give unto you, not as the world give, but as, 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 my, as my father gives. That, that peace is going to sanctify us because you're going to need it. We are going through the sufferings of this present time. We're going to need to know him as the God of all peace. The very God of peace will sanctify you holy, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is used here, and it, it it's talking about in that time, the, the end. It, it talks about, um, and I hate to use the word end game, but that you be, it, it's the all in all. It's the capstone. And, and so, uh, again, look at verse, look at uh, First Timothy. Come to verse Tim, First Timothy now. First Timothy chapter five. But yeah, that that over there said, I pray that pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved, blameless, unto, and all the way. In other words all the way up until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That, 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 that's what you're going to be doing. You're going to be doing that to the end. 
First, uh, chapter 5, verse 5. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers nine days. Now, wait a minute. Now, see, notice one that trusts in God, continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. But if she liveth, but if she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth, because you know she's living unto herself, she's dead, functionally dead in the sight of God because she can't bring forth fruit unto him. She's only bringing fruit unto herself. She's living unholy and not living in holiness and godliness. These things give in charge that they may be blameless. Now, this is that they be blameless, that they be perfect, that they be as the women over there that Paul was greeting and, and, and saluting in Romans 16. That's what he's talking about, that blameless. We're going to look at more verses, not just only blameless. We're going to look at maybe a couple verses uh, that use the word approved. And you're going to see that approved unto God is, is, is being used also uh, with blameless, um, without blame. It's another, it's blameless as well. But um, perfect, um, bond of perfectness. That and we're gonna look at those verses because it, it's it's vital to understand this, and I I, I can't I can't <laughs> I can't exhort how vital it is. So vital, Paul ended off the epistle that way. That's how vital it is that he had that he came and he he told them about that. And he, you look at most of Paul's the way Paul ends his epistles. I mean, if you just look at, for instance. And we're not going to do a survey, but just just how Paul ends First Corinthians. First Corinthians, um, Paul tells the he he warns them and he 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 exhorts them. He watch ye, verse thirteen. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Notice, be strong. Quit you. In other words, act you like godly men. Stand fast. Watch ye. Watch out. Watch out for the for the effects of this world. Don't be tempted by this world. Put on the Lord and Savior. Be strong in the power, power of his might. And then he, he told about the household of Stephanus. They addicted themselves unto the ministry. And and I just look at maybe a couple more. Look at the sec, uh, second Corinthians, the end of sec, the end of Second Corinthians. Same thing. We're not going to, again, we could look at all these verses. Some of these verses we did look at, but um, Paul told him, this is the third time I'm coming on to you. <laughs> but, but he said, um, uh, verse 4 uh, of chapter 13, he says, For though he was crucified, um, crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God, for we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves. Prove yourselves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? But this is, again, and he talks about he wished that they were strong. And, and, and Verse 9, for we are glad when we are weak and ye are strong. This also we wish even your perfection. This is the end of sex. You know, I don't have too much time to spend on this, but you look at the end of Galatians, same thing. The end of Galatians, and again, I don't want to, um, but yeah, we don't have time to get into that right now because we got so many other verses to cover here. Um, but at the end of Paul's epistles, we're going to see some of them. Ephesians chapter 6, he's ending it off. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And, and all these different things that are being spoken of there. But Let's just move on. Come over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. A very familiar verse that a lot of people know by heart, but they don't know the actual verse itself. Look, look at uh, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman and needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When people see this, all they see is rightly dividing the word of truth. And they say, well, this is 
God's word, all God's word is to us, uh, but not all, not our uh, world. <laughs> all God's word is for us, but not to us. And they'll say, yeah, well, Paul's, uh, you know, the plan to the Gentiles and there's a plan for the for the Jews. And there's so many different ways I could have said it because I hear it so many different ways. So that, that's why I'm picking and choosing how I, how I say it. But you get it. You know it. The idea is that they miss study to show thyself approved unto God. Now, what would be God's approval? That we only just be justified? We have so many saints that are only just justified. Are they approved? You think you think that God is a, that that is being approved unto Him because you're only just justified unto eternal life? Well, if you think that that's the case, why do you think study is 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 Study is the first word used in the verse. A man that is just only just justified unto eternal life, what is the need for him to study if he's only going to just be justified? That is to show thyself approved unto God. A workman, a workman is one that labors with God. A one a laborer is the ones that Paul saluted and greeted over in Romans 16. Those workmen and laborers he, he called workmen. He, he called a couple of them workmen. Guess what? He also called them strong in the faith. You think this verse applies to you? You ought to be one that desires to be a co-laborer, a workman, one that is approved unto God. One that needed not to be ashamed. What do you think that shame is about there? Needeth not to be ashamed. I don't have time to spend too much time on that, folks, because we, uh, man, we've got more to cover, so much more. Um, look at uh, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1. When I call, verse 5, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which first, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and Mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in thee also. Notice what Paul is saying here. I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. You know why, why Paul has to say he calls it into remembrance? Because it wasn't dwelling amongst Timothy. Timothy, it was in him. Paul knew that it was in him, but Timothy wasn't walking with it. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God. Notice the gift is used again. Remember we seen in Romans chapter 1 and, and, and uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that I might impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end. You may be established. And then over 1 Corinthians he says, um, um, that you come behind in no gift. And here you see that thou stir up the gift of God. That gift of God is the power, folks. That's the same gift that, that you're told over there not to him that is of power to establish you. That's the gift, the power. You know what? And most will say, no, I don't think that that's what that's talking about. Well, if you don't think that the power is the gift of God being spoken about, Look at the rest of it, which is in thee by the putting on my hands. Look at verse 7. For God has not given us. Wait a minute. If God has not given us something, what has he given us then? What did he give us? For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You see the power now? You see what God desires to give us? You see the gift? You see why this is making sense? I hope it's making sense now. Now to him that is of power to establish you. It's a gift he wants to give us that we operate upon. And you're going to see more about this great gift. Look at, look at uh, verse uh, 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed. Here's the shame, folks. Ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the gospel of the mystery? No. The power of God. The power of God. That it's according to that that we be partakers. And if you're a partaker of the afflictions, 
Aren't you going to need to know him as the God of all peace? Of course you are. And you know why you're going through afflictions? Because Satan is behind uh, the, the design to attack you as he's your adversary also. Because you are the son of God. You, If you're the son of God, why wouldn't the adversary of the of your father be your adversary too as i said before the person that owns coca-cola is adversaries with the owner of pepsi and believe me their sons or daughters know that the that that the that they are adversaries of that competitor because they know as soon as that person pass on they are going to inherit that um, his business. Now come over to uh, verse 9. Who have saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus. Notice this here. Before the world began. Remember I said we're going to look at all those before the world begins. With this, it, before the world began. God called that we be partaker of that power. If you don't think that's the case, why do you think when the Lord tempted Jesus Christ, he said he showed him all the kingdoms in a moment of time, and then he said, all this power will I give unto you, which was delivered unto me, to whomsoever I will I give it. This ain't the same power, folks, but at that time that was God's power, that man would have dominion over flesh and, and over the earth and be God's help meet. But a whole different story. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse 12. You know, we, you know, we see in this, he talked about all those spiritual gifts he gave. But those spiritual gifts were used for the um, knowledge gifts. But look at what he says here for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Notice what God's desire is, that we be no more, and that we grow up. You're going to see grow up in him in all things. But again, the knowledge of the Son of God is what we ought to be perfected in. And God desires that we be that and be not children. And someone say, well, no, I'm, I'm a child of God. Well, in this verse here, a child of God is, um, is a reproof. <laughs> it, it, it's actually being simple. You're still saved. A babe is a child of God. But they're a babe in knowledge child and knowledge can be tossed to and fro. There's no perfect man right there. There's no approved man right there. there there's, no, there's no man that, that is blameless right there. There is a difference. God would not have you to just be justified. He would have you in word to see verses to be complete in knowledge, not only just to be complete, as in Second Corinth, as in Philippians chapter 2 talks about. Oh, we are complete in him, and we are but we're not complete in knowledge. You don't just stand there and only just be complete in knowledge there. I mean, be complete uh, uh, in him in that sense. But look at um, look at verse um, look at verse 15. But speaking the truth, uh, well, let's just read verse 14 again. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried by with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, even Christ. Now, I'm going to move a little, a little faster here because I went over explaining some things, but folks, this is, as I said before, essential to, to, to cover this here. Because again, this is what God would have us the end to be to be mature sons in Christ and to continue to grow, to, to continue to grow in knowledge. 
And this is not all. When we finish Romans chapter 16, when we get, matter of fact, when we get to the review, after what we have, what we already know, you're going to, you're going to be looking at chapters one differently, two differently, three differently, four, and so on. You're going to be looking at those things a lot differently than you used to based upon now you're able to teach it to others. <laughs> you're going to be able to teach it to others and establish other faithful in this doctrine now. That's the point. I mean, I hope you'd be able to at this point. And then when we move on from Romans 16, we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to move right to Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to look at the doctrine of Ephesians chapter 1 about God establishing the saints in his wisdom. But then we're also going to, we're going to look at Ephesians 1, and we're going to compare it to Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at the similarity there, that there is with Ephesians, well, not the similarity, but if the saint is not operating upon Ephesians, he's going to be a Corinthian. And understanding because you're going to see the the it, it, notice i'm just going to say this and we'll move on because we got i'm using a lot of time here first corinthians it starts up the wisdom of men versus the wisdom of god and what do you think the uh, ephesians chapter one talks about in ephesians two what do you think it ends with the wisdom of god the word of god and but We'll get to that when we get there. But let's move on. Come over to first first Corinthians chapter two. First Corinthians chapter two, look at verse four. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. Notice, I want you to notice the power here. I want you to notice the uh before the world began. And I want you to notice perfect. All those are being used here in the same amount of verses, and it's a reason why. Look at um, verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. If your faith is standing in the power of God, couldn't you bruise Satan under your feet shortly? Of course you could. The, 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 the God of peace will. But most people like to put their faith in the and to have their faith stand in the wisdom of man. They they live by it. How be it we speak the wisdom among them that are perfect? Because guess what? When Paul says the word wisdom, the ones that are perfect, they know what Paul means by that. They know wisdom is has to do with sufferings, afflictions. Yea, all that will live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. They know that that's part of the wisdom. But when you, the ones that are not perfect and operating upon the wisdom of this world will tell you you're blessed if you're living, if you're goodly. You're blessed if you're living just fine. No aches and ails and pain, pains. Um, come over to... Um, Verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. And again, before the world. The wisdom of God in the mystery. And again, we understand what the mystery is, folks. But also, the aspect of it is God designed that the man operate upon his power. That also was before the world began. Look at... um which none of the princes knew had they for had they known it they would not have crucified the lord of glory but as it is written i have not seen or ear heard neither entered into the heart of man the things which god prepared for them that love him not all saints love him not all saints that have been rightly dividing the word of truth for 40 years love him what i mean by that is i'm not saying that they don't love him because he died for them but they don't love him enough to suffer for his sake they don't love him enough to suffer persecution they would rather be ashamed and not not stir up anything uh, that's a whole other study you know and when, when i when i get to 
the um, study I'm going to do, I've been doing on the attributes of the men and the women after Satan. The next one, part eight, is going to be going over the attributes of the man and woman after Satan. And it's going to be talking about the church and the pastor. That their ways can be after Satan. And we've seen, we've seen many of them when it says, not a novice, lest he be lifted up in pride and fall into a snare and reproach the devil and, and all those things. But let's just move on. Um, look, look at 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And this is, that was talking about which God has prepared for them that love him with his, with his selfless love. That they are going to suffer for his sake. It ought to enter into our hearts. Look at uh, verse 8. For this thing I, I besought the Lord thrice. Now this is an example of someone that loves love him. This is an example of someone that loves the Lord selflessly. This is the real love of God. Verse 8. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Now notice depart from me. Him. Me. He wanted the thing, that, but he, he operated upon selflessness when he learned what the Lord told him. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Notice he takes pleasure now in those things. He glories in those things. And when he's glorying in, in infirmities, when he's taking pleasure and glorying in reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake, then he's strong when he's weak. The power of Christ is resting upon him now. He's operating upon the power that's what he sees, the God of peace. Uh, now to him that is a power established Paul. And Paul's operating upon that power. Notice he said the power of Christ. And why does he say the power of Christ? Because the Lord just said something to him. My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength, he said, isn't that the power? That power is going to rest upon Paul now because the word of God took effect with him, within him. He bruised Satan under his feet. Remember, a messenger of Satan was sent. And what happened? When, when Paul did this, it sent Satan away. It bruised his head because of Paul's thinking with wisdom operating upon the power being approved, perfect. Come over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3. Look at verse 14. Of all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which ye are also called in one body, and be ye thankful. But notice charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. See, when Paul himself operated upon that love of God, he understood that peace, my grace is sufficient for thee. He, he besought the Lord, take it away. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Paul knew from what the Lord said, and wait a minute. If he says my grace is sufficient, he's saying that because he gave this to me on his behalf. The Lord is telling me, I'm giving you something. If someone gives us something, just say, for instance, there's a, it's raining. It's raining outside, but our child, and I hate to use this analogy here, but our child gives us a little tiny umbrella that doesn't cover us. You're not going to just say, are you out of your mind and throw it away? You're going to use that and say, you know what? That, that kid out of love gave me this. And, and, this is this is sufficient for me. I'm gonna allow I'm gonna allow this to work for me, because they out of their behalf they gave this to me, because they love me just that much. And that's how we ought to view 
God's God's gift unto us, the gift, the power, the power that He's given unto us. We might not value it that way because it don't it does nothing for our flesh. It doesn't do anything for our flesh at all. It, it does nothing, but it does something for your inward man. The inward man is the one that that becomes strong when the power of Christ is rested upon us. When when the Lord said, "My grace is sufficient for thee," God knew, and the Lord knew it wasn't going to take whatever was going on away. But what it did was it changed Paul's mind. He didn't allow it to remember. He besought the Lord three times. Evidently, it was affecting him. But after the Lord said that, it didn't affect him anymore. And when it didn't affect him, it affected it affected Paul, uh, um, uh, Satan. Satan was affected by that. Satan was defeated by that. He's like Satan is like, okay, there go there go one of God's people. I can get him all rattled up. There's another one I can get. It. And I'm not saying that Satan's actually doing these things himself, but he sees how oh he's supposed to be a man strong in the Lord. <laughs> Look how he's operating. Yeah, but when he sees that son, similar to Job, when he sees that son not allowing the doctrine, I mean, that is allowing the doctrine to work affection within him, and he's not allowing what Satan is doing, what he has his world doing, to affect him, he's not falling into the snare of the devil. He's not caught in his trap. He's not taken, led, led astray, but he's actually bruising the head of Satan. When we are operating upon the power and strong and wise into that which is good and simple concerning evil. Let's move on. Come over, come back to Romans 16 and we'll, we'll sum this up hopefully. Hopefully we can sum this all up. <laughs> Look at Romans 16. Now, I'm not trying to hurry through this folks at, by no means. Romans 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Notice that they're working for Satan. They're working for Satan in their own belly. And they're doing this to cause damage to the simple. Look at verse 19. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet, I would have you to be wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Remember we've seen what Paul said, what the Lord told Paul. My grace is sufficient for thee. Because that's a gift. That's a gift given on our behalf. Or on the Lord's behalf to us. And in him that is a power is given this on his behalf to us. The, the power. Look at come down to verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which is kept secret since the world began. And again. Now to him that is of power to establish you. If the, if, the, if the president wants to establish us in the power, and I'm not talking about just the president of the United States, the president of anything. It could be the president of the block club. doesn't matter what it is. If the president is establishing you in something, he's establishing you with his duties to someday take over his duties. That that's what we ought to look upon it as. Look at uh, Romans 15. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. You see we then that are strong. You see that strong, the strength there. Remember what, the, what Paul said? That when I am weak, then I am strong. And if you're strong, and it says infirmities of the weak, doctrinally, look at uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That, again, 
if you're strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, that's when we are strong. Our The Lord's uh, strength is made perfect in our weakness. And when that's the case, now we operate upon his strength. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles. Of the, notice this, against the wiles of the devil. You ain't just, you're not just going to stand against the wiles of the devil. You're going to bruise his head. You're fighting. You, you, the Lord is fighting. God the Father is fighting against. It, it, it's, a, it's a battle. They're being long-suffering. And, and, but they, you are here standing in the stead of our Lord with the word of God and the God of peace. You're told to put on the whole armor of God. Go to war, you're told, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in what? High places. And as I said before, we're told we wrestle. We fight. You're going to war. You're in battle. So it's befitting that when you see, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet. Notice what's being used, bruise, and under your feet. Because what's given here to the one that has power, if the God of peace can do it and is with his word, and he's establishing you in power, don't you think you'd be able to do it as well? But you're only going to be able to use the method and means that God gave you, the armor. And the armor is the God of peace. The doctrine of the God of peace, you putting that on, it's the perfect, direct and selfless love. The bond of perfectness. Being uh, that, that perfect, being blameless, strong. If you had to use Many words that that you could that you you are you are to be. You are to be an adopt. You have to be an adopted son, conform to the image of his son. You're told we've seen we've seen the verses. Approved, perfect, blameless, strong. I don't know if I said that already, but <laughs> again, that's what God is after. That's who God would desire that we be to the end that we may be blameless, holy, acceptable, sons, sons in Christ. That's what we ought to be in him. And next time we're going to look at, um, we're going to go through the issues of those three accordings, the according to, and then we're going to look at God only wise. We're going to see how far we get there. And um, again, we're not trying to rush anything at all. And then we'll get into the review. But I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And uh, until next time, thank you.